Mike Dolce returns to What The Fitness. What's up guys, it's Friday, and so you know what time it is. It's time for What The Fitness. Let's get them. But first, like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, or the algorithm. So this week, we have a submission from Mike Dolce. I have gone back and forth with Mike multiple times. Uh, Mike was a former contestant on The Ultimate Fighter. Obviously like a very accomplished mixed martial artist. To even get to that level is very, very difficult. If they put us together in an octagon, uh, I'm gonna get opened up like a pinata. So I'm, I have no problem admitting that. But if you put us in a scientific debate, I'm going to eviscerate him. That being said, I try to be as fair as I possibly can, which sometimes isn't that fair, but sometimes is. And so I've already watched some of this video, and I'm going to tell you what I agree with and what I disagree with. Tip number one, cardio. You must perform your cardio. No matter what anybody else says, trust me, you must perform your cardio. Ideally, you want to perform your cardio while fasted. But Dolce, fasted cardio and fed cardio burns the same Why amount of Nancy calories. Pelosi on the screen? Who cares? We don't do our cardio to simply burn calories. I think cardio is a useful fat loss tool because it increases energy expenditure, and there's also evidence that Exercise in general sensitizes you to satiety signals. Must you do cardio? Absolutely not. You can absolutely lose fat without doing cardio as long as you get a calorie deficit through your lifting and your nutrition. You don't have to do cardio. From 2019 to 2020, I lost almost 30 pounds and I did zero purposeful cardio. I just made sure I got a certain amount of steps each day. Now, some days that meant I had to go and walk for a little while to get my steps, but other than that, I did absolutely zero purposeful cardio. If I hit my step count number, which was 10,000 per day, which I usually do without even doing cardio, then I didn't do cardio. As far as fasted cardio, he's right. We don't do cardio to burn calories. We do it to lose fat. If we look at the studies that compare the actual loss of body fat in fed cardio versus fasted cardio, where they do the same amount of cardio and eat the same calories, what? do we see? Oh, wait. We see the exact same amount of the loss of body fat. Sorry, Mike, that you keep harping on this fasted cardio thing, but there's literally no studies that support this. If you want to do fasted cardio because it fits your schedule, it fits your lifestyle, because you wake up and you want to get it out of the way and you don't feel like eating before, totally good reason to do it. Totally reasonable reason to do it. But you don't have to, and it's certainly not superior. And what's interesting is later, he is going to reference a study by Brad Schoenfeld and really pumps up Brad Schoenfeld, which by the way, well-deserved. Brad's a fantastic researcher. But one of the studies I'm citing about fed versus fasted cardio was done by Brad Schoenfeld. So Mike, are you saying that your expert that you're promoting, Brad Schoenfeld, that he's absolutely right about this other thing, but full of shit about cardio? Like you gotta, what you gonna pick? Come on, which one is it? You could even just say, you know, I don't have any evidence to support this. I just prefer fasted cardio. And you know what? I would clap for you. Absolutely. Why does it have to be your way is the only way is the best way? That's it for cardio. Let's move on to what he says about building muscle. Step two, weight training. We gotta build muscle. You have to build muscle. You have to maintain your muscle. You have to train your muscle. Promoting resistance training, building muscle, I'm a fan. Absolutely agree. Now, you don't have to to lose fat, but it absolutely, resistance training will absolutely make fat loss more efficient and better overall because you will be specifically targeting adipose tissue, the loss of body fat while sparing muscle tissue. If you don't do resistance training, if you don't do exercise, when you're in a diet phase in a caloric deficit, you will lose a greater proportion of weight from lean mass compared to if you're weight training. So absolutely. So you're actually even losing the same amount of weight. If you're resistance training, you will lose more body fat. I agree that resistance training, good idea. Program is the push pull legs program. Run it seven days a week with no break. No break. That's right. Push pull legs, push pull legs, push pull legs, push pull legs. Keep going. Okay, so so basically he's saying um, do your upper body push, do your upper body pull, and then do legs, and then rotate through those with no rest. That can absolutely work. Uh, you're training each muscle group two times a week, a little bit more often because you're having one extra day per week if you're not taking the day off. But I mean, when we look at the studies on building muscle and frequency, frequency may help a little bit, 
but it's mostly a tool to distribute volume. So as long as you're doing enough number of hard sets over the course of a week, yes, if you're doing like 20 hard sets on a muscle group, probably makes sense to distribute over two or three workouts for sure, rather than stuffing it all into one, probably a little more efficient for overall muscle protein synthesis. But in terms of actually building mass, the research studies don't show a whole lot of difference. So it's mostly a tool to distribute volume. Can this be a good split? Sure. Do you have to do it that way? No. Can you take a rest day? Absolutely. In fact, I'm writing a book on building muscle right now, and I'm going through how you can set up your program based on how many days a week you want to train. Now, if you've only got, say, three days a week to train, you're going to have to stuff a lot more in those three days to hit your volume requirement to maximize your synthetic response, to maximize your muscle building, compared to if you're doing five or six days a week. But you can do it. It's about getting enough number of hard sets. Hard sets means sets in close proximity to failure throughout the course of the week. Frequency can be a good tool to distribute that volume. So I'm not necessarily disagreeing with what he's saying. I'm just saying you don't have to do it this way. And it's not necessarily better than other ways of doing it. Now, number three, the last part of getting absolutely shredded might be the most important part. It's your nutrition. Number one is you need to eat at least one gram per pound of body weight of protein. I'm a protein guy. I love protein. Got a thesis right over there about protein. I think high protein diets are a more efficient way to lose fat and retain lean mass and are a good idea overall, especially because of the added benefits on thermic effect of food, energy expenditure, and possibly satiety. But do you have to eat one gram per pound? As Jack Reacher likes to say, details matter. So when you say you must, you have to, you need, that is different. You can absolutely get shredded not eating one gram per pound of body weight of protein. Now. Can it help you? For sure. Do I recommend it? Yes. Do you need to do it? No. You can get shredded other ways, but I do think it's a good idea. Great eggs, great hemp seeds, great chicken, great salmon, great, 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 great. But the highest possible sources of protein is what you need. Dr. Brad Schoenfeld had recently, a few years ago, came out with a benchmark study that had said approximately 30 to 60 grams of protein eaten three to five times per day. All right, I'm going to toot my own horn. And who do you think is one of the researchers who talked about this stuff that Brad did the study on. The things that I've been talking about for, oh, I don't know, 20 years. Yeah, do I think getting 30 to 60 grams of protein at a meal? But probably don't need 60 grams, that's a, that's a lot. But 30 plus grams of protein at a meal, evenly distributed across the day, good idea? Absolutely, absolutely good idea. He said it a lot more intelligently than I it's just a nice said it. Picture of Brad. But that is the basic brass tacks of the conversation. 30 to 60 grams of protein eaten three to five times per day. Somewhere for most people, 40 to 50 grams eaten four to five times per day will be ideal. Um, I'm pretty sure the study didn't say 30 to 60 grams, by the way. I'm sure it's, I think it actually said like around 30 grams for most people. But people with more lean mass, people with lower protein quality in their diet, people who are following a plant-based diet, then yeah, maybe towards the upper end of that protein. That's what my PhD, PhD thesis showed. Mike says, I don't know what I'm talking about, but a lot of the stuff he's talking about is actually based off of research that I published. But hey, I digress. You should have medium carb days. Rarely should you have a high carb day. The heavier you are, the more body fat you need to lose, the less high carb days you need. Okay, let's just talk about calorie cycling, carbohydrate cycling. And I will jump to the TLDR, which is in research studies, looking at the loss of body fat for the most part, doesn't really seem to matter how you distribute your carbohydrates or calories. It's more about your weekly deficit. Doesn't seem to make a big difference. So do I like calorie cycling? Do I have higher and lower carb days? I do. Is it because I think it's better? No. It's because I like to eat more on my training days. But Lane, there's got to be research showing that that's better, right? Mm, not really. Uh, I do it because that's what I prefer. <gasps> See, Mike, I can admit when I do something that isn't necessarily supported by data just because I like it. <gasps> I didn't die. I was scared there for a minute. I thought that I was just going to spontaneously combust by admitting that. But geez, Mike, you should try it sometime. It's actually quite liberating. One low, one high. One low, one medium, one low, one high. One low, one medium, one low, one high. We can start a song about it. But 
Maybe weeks like four, five, six, you go too low, turn down to a one medium, one medium too low, one high. Weeks seven, eight, nine, you go three low, one medium, two or three low, one high. Ain't nobody got so time for that kind of So slowly you stage it out, you stage it out. Right, let's see what else is just nice. Your low day is a quarter cup of white rice. Your medium day is a half a cup of white rice. Your high day is three quarters of a cup of white rice. That is a, such an easy way. And whether it's white rice, whether it's three quarters of a cup. So one cup of cooked white rice is 44 grams of carbs. So you're telling me your high day involves one cup of cooked white rice. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing he means per meal. I'm guessing he means per meal. That's still at five meals. That's like 220 grams of carbs. Not exactly a high carb diet. Um, and if you're doing a quarter cup, that's like 11 grams of carbs at each meal. That's 55 grams of carbs overall. Then you add in whatever you get from vegetables and whatnot. Not very many carbs at all. Somewhere in there, he talks about like counting the, the carbs from vegetables. We do count the calories of vegetable consumption because I know some people who overeat certain type of vegetables and they say that those calories don't count. When you get down to single digit body fat percentage, those calories actually do start to count. So I do agree you count the carbs from vegetables because I mean, potato is technically a vegetable, uh, carrots are vegetables, peas are vegetables, and they are not, I don't want to say peas and carrots are high in carbohydrates, but they're higher compared to other, you know, more traditional vegetables or fitness vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, that sort of thing. But you still do get calories from them. They are a source of calories. Some people will say you don't need to count them because it's so low. Whatever. I don't, vegetables aren't going to make anybody fat for sure. But typically people who don't count calories from vegetables, then don't count calories from gum, then don't count calories from like licks of food or like random handfuls of stuff. And that can add up over time. So I just tell people to count everything because like if you're already weighing out your food, who gives a crap if you're counting vegetables? This one's been the worst video I've ever seen from him at all by far. And hey, if you do this stuff, can you get results? For sure. I am not saying you can't get results, but what I don't like is how he frames it as this is the best way to do this stuff. The only thing that I would say on there is the best way to do stuff would be the protein recommendations. I think those are pretty in line with what I would recommend uh, in terms of the amount of protein and how you distribute it and the sources of protein. Would agree with those. But most of the rest of it, it's not bad advice. It's not terrible advice. It's just the way it's framed is this is the best way to do things and that's simply not supported by the data. You have way more flexibility in how you can do things. You don't need to do it exactly this way. Can it work? Absolutely. Not the worst video I've ever seen. Me and Dolce have gone back and forth on social media before, whatever. Do I think he gives terrible advice? No. If you follow him, you can get results, obviously. Do I think he beats his chest a little bit without supporting data? And then he like cherry picks the data that fits his bias as we showed with protein, but then with the fasted cardio, he ignores that data. So whatever. He's not even in my top 100 of worst folks out there, but I just wish he would say the following. This isn't necessarily the best way of doing things. I just do it because I prefer it. Try it, Mike. I promise you it will set you free.